Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is an internationally renowned and highly acclaimed director who became a global sensation with the release of his very first feature film, Grease, which still remains one of the highest grossing and most beloved movie musicals of all time. He also directed The Boy in the Plastic Bubble, The Blue Lagoon, Summer Lovers, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, Getting It Right, White Fang, Shadow of Doubt, and one of my all-time favorite movies, It's My Party, and the critically acclaimed play, The Penis Chronicles. For almost 40 years, our guest has been at the forefront of experimenting with technology, digital cinematography, and virtual reality, which can be seen not only in some of his feature films, like Flight of the Navigator and Red Riding Hood, but also at the Disney theme parks, where for 10 years, his amazing 3D movie entitled Honey, I Shrunk the Audience was one of the most popular attractions. He also wrote and directed the virtual reality series Defrost, which was featured at Sundance and the Cannes Film Festival. And for many years, he's been a member of the Science and Technology Committee of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Our guest is also a much sought after educator, and he regularly teaches and lectures at film schools and film festivals. He created an online and DVD course of his former teacher, Nina Fosch's class, entitled the Nina Fosch Course for Filmmakers and Actors. He received an honorary doctorate from the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. And if all of that weren't enough, our guest is also an author. In 2019, he released his first book entitled Grease, the Director's Notebook, which is a retrospective look at the making of this classic film. And now he's released his fascinating new book entitled Drawing Directors, in which he reveals his unique talent for sketching using a technique called blind contour drawing. The book contains candidly drawn sketches, personal anecdotes, and comments about the work of some of his favorite directors, including Billy Wilder, Robert Wise, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Spike Lee, Quentin Tarantino, Clint Eastwood, and many more, including my dear friend, Henry Jaglum, who recently appeared on our show. I'm delighted to welcome the wonderful Randall Kleiser to our show. Mr. Kleiser, thank you so much for being here. Well, Harvey, I appreciate that amazing introduction, which I'll probably have to save and, and play whenever I show up anywhere. <laughs> well, that was your life. I, I want to start by asking you to explain what is blind contour drawing? Well, it's a technique that I learned in art school where you take your pen and put it on the paper and then you look at the subject and you move the pen and your eye at the same time without looking down, hopefully. I mean, sometimes I do look down so that the eye will not be where the ear should be, but mostly it's just, uh, you know, doing it like that. And the subject usually doesn't know that they're being drawn. Well, what makes these drawings really fascinating besides your technique is that none of the people you drew were aware that you were doing it. So what do you do if a person moves or changes position midway through the sketch? I have to start over. Usually it takes at least 20 drawings to get anything that looks uh, remotely like the person, but it's a very, you know, it takes a lot of time and, and concentration to get it to work. And uh, I, I just find it fascinating to try to capture people when, uh, in these moments when they're reflective or, or thinking about something and, you know. After you finished drawing each of these directors, did you show them the drawings? No, none of them have seen them. Uh, and I... I don't know what they'll say. I, 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 the only person who saw the drawing was Steve Spielberg because he he caught me, and he he looked down. He said, "Oh, that looks like me." And I said, "Can I put it on the cover?" And he said, "Yes." So that's <laughs> why it's on the cover. Well, it's such a unique book, not only because of your drawings, but because of the obvious affection and respect you have for your fellow directors. It's a rather obvious fact that directors don't usually work together on a film. But would you like to co-direct a film with one of your colleagues or does the Directors Guild not allow that? They don't allow that because they figure they figure it should be one man, one film. And and there are there are people who work in teams, but it's very unusual. And usually if they want to do that, they have to come to the Directors Guild Council and ask for permission to have a waiver to do that. For instance, Ethan Cohen and Joel used to do it separately. They, one would produce and one would direct. 
and they would get those credits, but they were actually co-directing. Then they came to the guild and said, look, we've been doing this for a long time and we really do co-direct. So can we please have co-directing waiver? And, and they were given that. And uh, But anybody who comes to try to do that, they have to come and appear before the council and ask. I want to ask you about some of the directors you featured in your book, starting with Robert Altman. You said that he influenced the way you made It's My Party, which is, in my opinion, one of your greatest films. How did he influence you? Well, he had a great technique he used where he put radio mics on all the actors and he rehearsed them ahead of time and told them who their characters were so that they could do improvs. And then he would just let them go, let them loose. <laughs> and they would start doing improvs and the camera could go across them. And the, the sound guys could bring up their mic as the camera went across so that you pick up pieces of conversations that are that seem very real because they are. And uh, we use that in It's My Party so that you've got the feeling of the, of the people, the real people going through this experience and having normal conversations and just pick up pieces of them. Another director who influenced you a great deal was Robert Wise. He was one of your mentors and role models. What would you say was the most important thing you learned from him? I think how to treat people. You know, he was a real gentleman and very humanistic. He he was not like a typical Hollywood type. You know, he was very supportive of young people, uh, especially, you know, I went up and asked him to see my student film when I met him at USC. And he invited me to Universal and set up a screening and looked at my movie, then took me to lunch and talked to me about what I could do better. And uh, through the years, he was always very supportive and actually ended up signing my application for the Academy years later when I, when I wanted to join. And he also helped me just before I directed Greece. He he had a uh, we had a dinner at Nina Fasha's house where he was talking to me about how to, to uh, listen to the choreographer and listen to the cameraman and you know was guiding me through how to do a musical. Well, Robert Wise told you not to direct Greece unless you could have at least a year to prepare. You were given That's only five weeks. Is that the only advice from him that you never took? True. I mean, I was panicked when he told me that, but there was no way I was going to quit the job. Uh, so, <laughs> but yes, the way he did musicals, you did need a year because he was very uh, meticulous about how he would put it together and, and all the, the, the storyboards and every shot was lined up and rehearsed over and over and over again. And we just didn't have that kind of time or, or uh, to do that. And Greece was sort of thrown together very quickly and very haphazardly in a way because of the time. But I think it gave it a kind of a looseness that, that we would not have had if we had a year to do it. Yes, because it was a Broadway show. And so I liked the fact that it kind of felt spontaneous. Yeah, you know what? The, the, uh, in a way, it had been rehearsed for a year because it had been rehearsed for more than a year because it had been on Broadway for so many years. So I never thought of it that way. But yeah, I didn't have to worry so much about not having all that time. You drew and wrote about Bill Condon, who directed Gods and Monsters, which was about the director James Whale. Is it true that at one point you were interested in making that movie? I really was. I, I loved the book, Father of Frankenstein. I loved it. I wanted to do it. But there was a scene in it that kind of disparaged a little bit George Cukor, who was a friend. And so I, 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 I didn't pursue trying to do that movie because of that. I, I just, you know, didn't want anything to put down George. Well, bravo. One of the most fascinating chapters in your book is the one about Buster Keaton, whom you met wow. in 1964 on the set of Beach Blanket Bingo. Roger Ebert called him the greatest actor director in the history of the movies. Can you tell us a bit about your conversation with him? Well, he was doing a little cameo in this beach movie, and I had snuck onto the set because I was a film student trying to learn about how movies are made, and nobody seemed to recognize him. He was sitting over in the corner, and I, I went, wow, it's Buster Keaton in person. So I went over and talked to him just about, you know, uh, the amazing stuff that he did in the movie The General, which Orson Welles says is the greatest movie ever made, which is surprising, but... I mean, that movie was like a David Lean movie. There was thousands of costumed extras. There was a, a scene where a 
a freight train or a, a steam engine goes off a bridge, kind of like Bridge on the River Kwai, you know, huge stuff, you know, gigantic movie. Anybody who wants to see uh, an epic should see The General by Buster Keaton. Amazing. Another surprise entry in your book for me, Mr. Kleiser, was Jerry Lewis, whom I never think of as a director. You interviewed him in 2009 for the Directors Guild of America's Visual History Archives. I'm dying to ask you, was he aware that you put him on the screen at the drive-in in Greece? He did. Yeah, he spotted that. I, 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 I asked him, I said, hey, did you notice that I put you in Greece? He said, oh, yeah. I ordered up Greece when, when I heard you directed to see if you uh, were going to embarrass me. <laughs> and he said, no, you did a good job. And since I mentioned Greece, I want to mention John Rich, who directed Our Miss Brooks. Is it true that Our Miss Brooks gave you the idea to cast Eve Arden as the high school principal in Greece? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I, I grew up watching Armis Brooks every every week. I loved it. She was such an iconic, wonderful comedian. And to work with her after seeing her as a kid growing up was just a super thrill. And to combine her with Dodie Goodman, who I saw, I guess, on the Perry Como show or some, some one of those shows, to put those two together and just let them improv was so much fun. You know, there, that was there's nothing in the script. We just they were sitting there and I think she had a couple announcements to make. But the two of them, I just said, see if you can come up with something fun. And they they started, you know, coming up with the dinging, the banging of the, the, the xylophone and all that stuff. It was really great. Oh, it was wonderful. You know, Paul Schrader, whom you featured in your book, used to say that it didn't matter what else he did. The first line of his obituary is always going to be that he wrote Taxi Driver. Now, of course, the same thing is going to be said about you, that you'll always first be remembered for directing Greece. Does it yeah. bother you at all? Well, no, because, I mean, how many directors have a chance to have a movie that goes for 45 years and people are still talking about it and going to it and all, uh, children, grandmas, teenagers? It's, it's, a, it's like a one of a kind thing. So I'm very happy to be associated with that. I'm glad to hear that because it's such a joyful movie. I learned so much from your book, Mr. Kleiser, about the way these directors approach their craft. For example, you quoted Sean Baker as saying, sometimes you can learn more by watching bad films than good ones. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I, I, I love watching bad movies because I realize, oh, that's what you don't do. <laughs> or, you know, sometimes you get ideas from bad movies about uh, if you did it this way, it would be much better. Or maybe a bad, um, a bad shot like that could be used for a different reason. I mean, there's a, and and soundtracks. You know what works, what doesn't. I think you do learn much, much more from bad movies. You know that's so interesting to me because prior to my retirement as a judge, I learned a lot when I was a lawyer from bad judges. Oh. Yeah. You know, I created my persona on the bench based on the behavior I did not want to manifest when I became a judge. Great so idea. it's interesting that that works in many, probably many industries. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. Now, your colleague, Tony Bill, tells film students to learn acting and producing before moving into directing. Do you agree with that advice? Yep. I, I do. It's so important to know about, especially about producing, uh, how to come in on time and on budget, because if you don't, you won't survive. If, if a director gets caught up in some, you know, scene that he thinks is fantastic, but it's going to put him over budget, it's not a good idea because it, it destroys your reputation and you don't get to call back. In terms of acting, yes, if you know how an actor feels, when they're on camera and every well, the whole crew's watching them and they have to come up with something like an emotional moment. If you haven't experienced that, you have no idea what they're going through, even down to simple things like eye lines. You know, I've noticed when I've done some acting that if, if the camera's on you and you're trying to do something with a partner, like a, a, another actor, and there's crew people moving around behind the camera, it's extremely distracting. Now, I wouldn't know that if I hadn't experienced it. So whenever I'm shooting a, a scene with actors, I make sure that the eyeline is clear. Oh, I never would have thought of that. 
Alan Parker said that film directing is a crash course in megalomania. After having a hundred people obeying your every whim all day, it's hard to go home and be normal. What did you think <laughs> of that comment? Yeah, well, of course, you know, it is addictive, you know, the idea of being like the king for <laughs> king for a day, but or for a couple of weeks. It, it's it's an amazing experience, uh, especially when you're doing something creative. I mean, I I, I guess if, if anybody who runs any kind of a company experiences a bit of that, but but the the movie business is so different, and you're doing something different every day, and you're creating, making dreams come true in a way. You know, you're taking things that didn't exist and making them, translating them for other people. So it's it's an amazing thing to have the power and the uh, of creating a big thing for other people to see it's 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 great i love it but you do not have a reputation of being a megalomaniac no i like to well you know what i think the reason i the reason my set my set behavior is based actually on working with emotionally disturbed children i used to work in a summer camp my dad was head of psychology for a school for emotionally disturbed children and he got me a job working there as a counselor and i was teaching the kids how to do lanyards you know those things that you put around your neck and they were all extremely disturbed and they you know, had little trips that were going on all the time and i had to find a way to get them all to focus and do these little lanyards and that's where i learned how to deal with people you know because a lot of people in the movie business are emotionally disturbed. You know, that's a fascinating way to develop people skills, diplomacy, patience. Yeah. Really, that's amazing. I wish that more people in the legal field had done that. <laughs> Your work has inspired many directors, Mr. Kleiser. For example... James Cameron has said publicly that your sequence in the Blue Lagoon, where the characters swam through phosphorescent water, influenced some of his scenes in Avatar. That must be so gratifying. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think he exactly said that. I just said it to me, and I, I, I've sort of uh, repeated it because I was so thrilled that he found something in Blue Lagoon that he liked. It was after I told him how much I love the sequence in the Titanic where the, the, the ship broke in two and, and fell, fell apart. That was such a, an amazing cinematic experience and, and done so well and so realistically. It was just, a, you know, it was like a Cecil B. DeMille moment. Oh, it really was. I loved reading about Christopher Nolan, who directed Oppenheimer, you have a very special reason to be grateful to Robert Oppenheimer for inventing the bomb that ended the war, don't you? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, my dad was at D-Day and he came back to Lebanon, Pennsylvania after D-Day and was scheduled to go to uh, Japan to continue fighting the war. The bomb dropped and then he ended up being able to marry his high school sweetheart, my mom, and that's where I came from. So had that not happened, I wouldn't be here. Thank you, Robert Oppenheimer. <laughs> I want to tell our viewers that you can uh, learn Robert. more about Randall Kleiser by going to his official website, randallkleiser.com. Well, sir, I have only one more question for you, and it's this. The famous director, Damien Chazelle, said that if he had to show a movie to aliens from another planet to explain what cinema is, he would show them The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. What movie would you send them? The Ten Commandments. Why? Well, I just, I saw it when I was 10 years old and it stuck with me as, you know, the essence of a movie, Hollywood movies. I mean, it was the, the design of the costumes, the sets, the colors, the, the clear, clear, clear storytelling, even though when you look at it today, it's over the top. But but as a kid, I, I really could follow everything. And it was so simple and clear, you know, clear storytelling. And like I say, now when I look at it, I, I, I see it through the eyes of a 10-year-old. So I, I, I can also see it through the eyes of, you know, a, an adult and see the, the flaws, but but I still see it through those young eyes. So when you see a movie that, let's say you consider it not a good movie, but it could have been good, would you have liked 
to do a remake and make it the right way? Well, I think that it is a good idea to remake bad movies, not good ones, because when you try to remake a good one, uh, it's going to fail. So I kind of like, you know, coming up with my own projects or or finding a book or, or something. I don't really want to remake movies. I, I, uh, I'd rather just find new stuff. Well, I got to tell you, Mr. Kleiser, it's been an enormous honor meeting you and having this opportunity to interview you. Your films, not just Greece, but all of the ones I mentioned in my introduction have really impacted people in a very emotional way. And I want you to know that having you on our show has been tremendously gratifying to me. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Well, thanks, Harvey. And as usual, you've done your amazing homework. You wow. always do it on all your podcasts. I've watched them and, and you, you must spend hours getting ready for these things. Yeah, but it's a pleasure, let me tell you. Okay. Our guest has been the legendary director, Randall Kleiser, whose new book, Drawing Directors, is now available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.